tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Well, clear in my driveway and then clear in the road here just to keep it safe. The tow trucks are running ragged and the ambulances as well. So it's keeping everybody busy. A blast of winter tracking the snow and wind across southern BC also. Unfortunately, the calfing barn was well involved in fire and that's where uh, we had no chance of saving them. Fire races through a Pitt Meadows dairy farm killing more than two dozen cows and... Anything goes in through one of the entry tunnels and the gates, goes in, stays in, can't get out. Cracking down on crab poachers, 200 traps seized in Boundary Bay. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. Wicked winds are expected to hammer Metro Vancouver, the Fraser Valley and parts of Vancouver Island tonight. That could spell trouble for areas already slammed by heavy snow today. The CBC's Tina Lovegreen joins us live now from Falls Creek. Tina, how bad is it expected to get? Anita, Mike, we could see winds up to 90 kilometers an hour. Environment Canada warning that the winds could be so strong they could damage buildings, toss around loose objects, potentially causing injuries. And we could also see power outages, especially in areas where we've seen heavy snow on trees fall today. So areas like on Vancouver Island where we saw an impressive amount of snowfall today. On Vancouver Island, a big dump of snow up to 10 centimeters of snow in some areas and more is on the way. We're going to see a second pulse of Arctic air reach the island this evening, intensifying those bands. Driving conditions treacherous. A lot of MVIs are happening right now, just with, with that cold temperature all of a sudden. If I had left 10 minutes later, the road would have been clear and that would have been as much slush. But unfortunately, I thought I'd beat the, the weather home and it beat me. Cars sliding off roads, bus service cancelled in Greater Victoria. On the Malahat, commercial vehicles are chaining up, with winter tires mandatory for anyone driving over the mountain pass. South of the border, a state of emergency in Washington. 15 to 20 centimeters of snow is predicted to blanket the Emerald City. Seattle residents were urged to stay home, many stocking up on supplies, something the state governor was asked about at a news conference with B.C. Premier John Horrigan. Can you address the issue that people are kind of, when they go into grocery stores, they're just taking everything off the shelves and not leaving it for other people? What advice or wisdom would you give to those people? Uh, leave two bananas for the governor. That's all I'm asking. <laughs> Here in Vancouver, a light dusting, and I mean very, very light. It snowed for just a few minutes, but enough to alarm some people. Right now I'm worried how am I going to go back. I live in Coquitlam, so yeah, it's just, uh, am I going to be able to go home? While the storm slid past Metro Vancouver, extreme cold is gripping much of Canada. Temperatures dipping to minus 50 in some regions. Folks there were asked about our fears over the expected snowstorm. I hope they can survive. Say hi to my dad for me. Tell him that I might need a new mustache because it might be freezing off soon over here. <laughs> I'll be gentle this morning and say good luck in dealing with it. I know you're not equipped as well as some other winter cities, so I hope you do well. Enjoy it. It'll be fun. <laughs> Advice people in Victoria are at least taking to heart. Got to embrace it and enjoy it as much as possible. That's what we're doing. So we might have dodged snowmageddon here in Vancouver this time, and it's because the snow pattern has been super spotty. It's been cold, but too dry to see that kind of snow we saw in Victoria and in Seattle. Uh, but not to worry. We will see another snow pattern um, pass through on Sunday through Monday, and this cold air, it's going to stick around till at least the third week of February. Mike, Anita. All right, Tina Lovegreen reporting from False Creek tonight. Thanks. <laughs> All right, we have new details tonight in the legislature spending scandal. The Vancouver Sun has obtained a leaked copy of the responses by the clerk and sergeant at arms to allegations of inappropriate spending. Our Dan Burrett is here with those details tonight. Dan, how are Craig James and Gary Lenz defending themselves? Well, they are lengthy responses. And again, these were obtained by the Vancouver Sun. Let's start, first of all, with the infamous wood splitter that was picked, uh, that was purchased. 
James, Craig James, insists that he did not take it home for him and Gary Lenz to use. He says Lenz has never been to his house before the day they were moved from the legislature. James claims he was storing them for while storage space was being built at the legislature, including a concrete path and pad for the trailer. And he was also mentioned that apparently this was all part of the legislature being seen as a an emergency help so that if there was an, an emergency, that could mean moving emergency items, cutting beams to rescue people and cutting and splitting wood for heat and light if there's no power. There was also an issue of a large check for uh, an insurance claim. James says that uh, the claim is that James received a $250,000 retirement allowance in 2012. James says it wasn't his idea to create this benefit, and after former Speaker Bill Beresoff got legal advice about it, he later brought that program to an end. What about that truckload, alleged truckload, of booze? James denies taking that amount of booze to former Speaker Bill Beresoff, driving it to him in the Okanagan. He does say he took some alcohol, certainly not $10,000 worth, to Beresoff's house in the Okanagan, and that Beresoff gave him a check for the booze payable to the Legislative Assembly. He says it's in the record somewhere. We also learn about something about headphones. These are part of those expenses that, uh, in fact, were breaking, uh, getting the public's ire. James expensed about $500 for noise-canceling headphones, expensive ones. A purchase, James argued in a response, was because, quote, I suffer from a condition which causes ear problems when flying, arising from a combination of sound and cabin pressure. The noise-canceling headphones were purchased to alleviate that condition. One thing James, the clerk of the House, does cop to is the digital subscription to magazines. That was part of those other expenses that seem to get people's backs up. He says they should not have been charged to the legislature, and he will pay them back. There is a lot of reading on this, and as we said, the Vancouver Sun has obtained these documents. So if people are interested, they can go to that website. And again, we're still waiting to find out more details all about this, and we'll have more at 11 o'clock and on our website, cbc.ca slash bc. Anita, Mike. Okay, Dan, Dan Burrett reporting live tonight. A woman has been hit and killed by a car in Surrey. It's just the latest death on streets that some say are becoming increasingly dangerous. But as Jesse Johnston explains, city officials have an ambitious plan to dramatically cut down on road deaths. It's a scene that's all too familiar along King George Boulevard in Surrey. Just after 7 this morning, a woman was killed in a crash near 68th Avenue. The city recently identified its 50 most dangerous intersections, and this was one of them. King George Boulevard is one of the, the key corridors for us. 65% um, of our collisions occur on 5% of our roads, so we know where those are happening. About 1,200 people are injured on Surrey's roads each year. That doesn't include the 20 others who were killed. The city wants to reduce those numbers by 15% over the next five years, and eventually, bring an end to traffic deaths altogether. The first piece was really looking at the data. What are the problems? What do we really, what are we dealing with? We've got the numbers in terms of how many people have died and the number of injuries we have, but we need to know where they're happening. The city calls its road safety strategy Vision Zero. The concept is simple enough. Figure out why your high collision areas are so dangerous and then make them safer. Uh, because in a lot of cases, sometimes it's, uh, driver behavior, but sometimes, especially in a developing community like Surrey, uh, the issue might be the volume of traffic. The infrastructure actually needs to change. Infrastructure upgrades usually aren't cheap, but the city has found several inexpensive ways to reduce crashes. Some examples we've shared today are simply giving uh, pedestrians a little advance time to enter into intersections before the cars uh, move, and that way it raises their visibility uh, and reduces the, the chance by a significant percentage of a collision occurring with a pedestrian. The motto for the project is, every life matters. That's what city planners keep in mind as they try to achieve their goal of zero fatalities. It's ambitious, sure, but after another deadly morning on Surrey's roads, they'll tell you it's the only acceptable outcome. Jesse Johnston, CBC News, Surrey. In the North Okanagan, one man is dead. A second is in custody after a violent break-in at a home in the community of Lavington. As Brady Strachan reports, investigators are now at a second scene in Vernon where the deceased was located. 
This house on this quiet street in Lavington is surrounded by police tape. The RCMP say early this morning there was a violent break in in the home that left one person inside injured. A second person was later found with a fatal gunshot wound 20 kilometers away in Vernon. Police say the break in happened around one o'clock this morning. They were called to the home after a report of gunshots. The scene is now quiet, but evidence is still clearly visible. A smashed window on the home's front door. The door still ajar. Investigators have also placed several markers in the snow to indicate evidence. Further down the street, police have flagged this small white cardboard box as possible evidence. And in Vernon, investigators are at the Village Green Hotel. This minivan in the parking lot was covered Friday morning by a black tent. It is here where the man with a fatal gunshot wound was found. Staff at the hotel declined to comment about the incident, but investigators have been on the scene all day gathering evidence. Constable Kelly Brett is with the Vernon RCMP. The first report that was received in Lavington, um, we believe is connected to the second report that we received just approximately half an hour later. Um, we believe the two are related at this time. However, we're still working through all those details. Um, we've got all hands on deck. We've got multiple officers engaged in this investigation from both um, our major crime unit here, as well as the Southeast District Major Crime Unit. The RCMP have offered no information about the identity of the deceased man or the man who is in custody. Neighbours here in Lavington say the people that live in this home have only been here a year or two. They describe them as quiet neighbours who keep to themselves. Brady Strachan, CBC News in the North Okanagan. More than 200 crab traps with about 1,200 crabs in them have been seized from the Boundary Bay area. The Department of Fisheries and Oceans says the two-day recovery effort is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to illegal poaching in the Lower Mainland. As John Hernandez reports, some are questioning whether enough is being done. One by one, crews from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans threw these crabs back into the water. All of them were rescued from unidentified traps sitting at the bottom of Boundary Bay. Boundary Bay is probably one of the areas uh, in British Columbia and maybe in North America that has the highest density of lost traps and there are traps that are ghost fishing. It's zap strap or the plastic strap keeping it shut. DFO officer Art Dembski says over 200 traps were recovered in the two-day effort. Some of them were lost but the bulk of them appeared to have been dropped illegally. There were no buoys attached and some were even tied shut so nothing could escape. If the escape mechanism is zap strap shut or doesn't have rock cord uh, those traps only have to be baited once. Fish, shellfish, other invertebrates go in there. They actually become the bait themselves. Uh, the crabs cannibal cannibalize each other. Crews found the traps by dragging a hook along the ocean floor. Dembski says poachers who drop illegal traps mark their GPS coordinates and recover them at night. It could be anyone from the recreational uh, side of things to uh, First Nations to commercial industry. Overnight patrols catch a handful of poachers each year, levying fines and even seizing entire vessels. But many continue to operate, much to the dismay of local fishermen. They're ruining my livelihood and, and, and ruining the livelihood of a lot of honest, hardworking people. Stuart McDonald says he's frustrated so few of the poachers have been caught, while local stocks are being decimated. We're happy that they're seizing the traps. What we want is to arrest some criminals. Let's get some charges and convictions. Illegal crabs can yield tens of thousands of dollars for poachers, and the crabs can even make their way into local markets. The DFO is urging buyers to ask sellers where their crabs came from and to report any suspicious activity. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, more trouble for the man convicted of operating the biggest immigration fraud scheme in B.C. history. The province has started legal action to try to seize two Richmond properties connected to Sonny Wang, claiming they're the proceeds of crime. The CBC's Eric Rankin has the story. I already got Sonny, right? So I don't want to interview, okay? Sonny Wang has kept a low profile after serving one-third of a seven-year sentence for immigration fraud and income tax evasion. As an unlicensed immigration consultant, he had at least 1,200 clients, charging them $10 million to help them fraudulently obtain permanent residency and even citizenship, allowing them to falsely call Canada home. Now Wang himself could soon be homeless. 
The province is going after two Richmond properties connected to Wang, alleging this home on number four road and a condo in this tower on number three road were obtained through the proceeds of crime and used for unlawful activities. From 2006 to 2014, Sonny Wang ran Nucan Consultants and Wellong International Investment, running ads to attract Chinese residents who wanted status in Canada, but to stay in China. He altered entry and exit stamps on passports, making it look like his clients had spent the required amount of time in Canada to gain status here. In an action now filed in B.C. Supreme Court, the Director of Civil Forfeiture alleges the address of the number three road property was used for 20 clients who used it as a false Canadian address, and that a police raid found fraudulent Chinese entry and exit passport stamps at the number four road property. The civil action also alleges Wang tried to hinder the recovery of any money by having both properties transferred to his wife for $10 and citing natural love and affection but Wang remains a beneficial owner of both properties. The director of civil forfeiture wants the home and condo seized and sold, the money going to the province. Wang declined a TV interview today, but told CBC News he's surprised by the attempt to seize his properties and will be talking to his lawyer. None of the allegations in the civil action has been proven in court. Eric Rankin, CBC News, Vancouver. An overnight fire in Pitt Meadows at a dairy farm has killed 25 cattle. However, the ranchers there were able to save 145 of the herd. Fire started shortly after midnight on Old Dudney Trunk Road. Three structures on the farm were destroyed. Fire officials say the buildings were made of wood frame and metal cladding, making it difficult to put the fires out. When they burn, it makes it very difficult to uh, get extinguishment, especially when they collapse because the uh, Metal cladding doesn't allow the water to get to where you need it to go. Uh, so we had to get an excavator in to uh, break apart the metal cladding and allow us to get in there and uh, fully extinguish the fire. Cause of the fire still under investigation. It is not believed to be suspicious. Canada's transport minister is ordering rail companies to take precautionary safety measures after Monday's fatal train derailment in eastern B.C. Any train that's used its emergency air brake is now mandated to apply the hand brakes when stopped on a steep slope. Three Canadian Pacific crew members were killed after their freight train started to move in field BC on its own. The Transportation Safety Board says no hand brakes were applied on that train. Today's order will be in effect for, quote, as long as necessary. An investigation into the exact cause of Monday's accident is ongoing. Well, students in Surrey were given a crash course in CPR yesterday. And eight, and nine, and ten, and one, and two, and three, and four. Tamanua Secondary School was the first of ten schools to participate in the training program. Students are given mannequins and taught how to perform CPR and also how to operate an automated external defibrillator. Those behind the program say it empowers kids to act quickly if an emergency hits. You can increase a person's chances of survival by up to 75%, but it has to be done quickly. You need to call 911, but you also need people who witness the emergency able to perform CPR, call 911, and use a defibrillator to save a life. More than 3,000 Surrey students will receive the training per year. Amy Bell is here now with the first look at the weather and Amy not quite the storm <laughs> that people expected here in Metro yeah, Vancouver. Yeah it was the snowmageddon that uh, wasn't meant to be although we did see a lot of significant significant snow over on <laughs> Vancouver Island. Uh, we just saw a few little random flurries here and there for most of Metro Vancouver. There's still a slight chance we could see some overnight but really it's the cold that we're going to have to deal with. We do have warnings up for much uh, of the province right now with the extreme cold so this arctic outflow right from the interior through to the coastlines and that means overnight uh, those wind chill factors are dipping down to about minus 20 or lower in some areas so the risk of frostbite is very high and then we do have some wind warnings as well for uh, some areas uh, just the eastern Fraser Valley we will see those winds picking up a bit in Vancouver Metro Vancouver but for the most part it's east of us uh, to the Fraser Valley and uh, some areas along the uh, water on Vancouver Island so we'll keep an eye on that tonight but certainly potential for some damaging winds.
Now what we're going to see or what we did see was a lot of this snow getting pushed further south and just missing us. We did get lucky in that sense, even though we were very lucky and ready for it. Over the next couple of days, we're going to stick with that cold weather, but we have plenty of sunshine coming up and I'll have all the details coming up shortly. Thanks very much, Amy. You're welcome. This weather update is brought to you by your local Remax agent. The experience, the tools, the know-how. That's the sign of a Remax agent. And just a reminder for those of you watching our newscast online on Facebook, remember it does end at the bottom of the hour. Yes, and if you want to see Amy's full forecast and watch the rest of the show, tune in on YouTube or our website, cbc.ca slash bc. Sentenced to life with no chance of parole for 40 years. We'll have reaction as the man who confessed to killing six men at a Quebec City mosque learns his fate. Well, if you are tuning in online, happy Friday to you, or as yes. some say, Friday. Friday. <laughs> <laughs> Here is a little story about a problem you'd never hear about in Canada. Apparently, Ireland hasn't had a suitable uh, ice for ice hockey in almost a decade, but now, with the help of Montreal's Irish community, that's about to change. Kate McKenna has the exclusive story. For us, this is a familiar scene. In Ireland, not so much. This is how the Irish flying ducks practice, on inline skates because there's no rink space available. We've nothing in the Republic of Ireland, so we, we train on wheels. Um, or else the commercial pop-up rinks, like the, the Christmas rinks. Ice hockey is still considered a niche sport in Ireland. Despite that, there are multiple teams, just nowhere to play. I suppose ice hockey uh, is perfectly suited to Irish people. <laughs> uh, we have hurling, we have, a, we have a lot of contact sports here. Um, it's just the facilities. That's set to change. In 2016, a member of the United Irish Societies of Montreal heard about their rink problem. Kevin Murphy contacted the Ducks, asking them to fly over and walk in the annual St. Patrick's Day Parade. Within minutes, hours, uh, right away, they answered back saying, Yes, for sure. So they did. They played hockey every day, walked in the parade, and most importantly, they met Justin Trudeau. They explained their rink problem to the Prime Minister. He really uh, took it on. Like, he really understood what they wanted to do, and he, I won't say he promised, but uh, he did tell them that he would do what he could. Trudeau remembered the Flying Ducks. Four months later, when he was in Dublin on official business, he brought up the team with Irish officials. Your Prime Minister mentioned our club um, twice in his speech when he came to visit over here, which was, was phenomenal. From there, she says, the ball started rolling. They've secured funding, and they are in the final negotiations to reopen the rink that closed 10 years ago. The kids that just want to play a sport that they love, right? And it's the same thing here. So it, it's good to be part of. Justin Trudeau responded in a statement, saying, it is fantastic news that the Flying Ducks and the Irish people will finally have a rink to call their own. Having more Irish youth playing hockey and growing the game will enhance Canada and Ireland's already deep relationship and strong people-to-people -people ties. If everything goes according to plan, the rink should open this August. Some people from Montreal are planning on flying over for the grand opening. Kevin Murphy is going to be there, and he's hoping to borrow some skates and hit the ice with the team. Kate McKenna, CBC News, Montreal. That's fantastic. We do take it for granted out here. Yeah, we do, for sure. <laughs> That's great for them, super. Uh, by the way, if you want to ask us any questions or send us feedback about this newscast, you can get in touch with us directly on Twitter. Yes, and we'll be back with the latest numbers on jobs across the country in just a few minutes. The man who confessed to killing six men at a Quebec City mosque has been sentenced to life with no chance of parole for 40 years. Alexandra Bussinat will be eligible for parole at the age of 67. Alison Northcott has more. For those whose lives were forever changed by the 2017 attack, today's decision was a painful disappointment. Eamon Derbali was shot by Alexandre Bissonnette seven times. We were astonished uh, and we were very upset after this uh, sentence. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't know how he, he, um, 
He gave this, uh, this sentence. In his 246-page decision, Justice Francois Ouat said Bissonnette's crime will be forever ingrained in our collective memory. He said when Bissonnette went to the mosque that night and began shooting, it was planned and highly premeditated, motivated by prejudice and a visceral hatred for immigrants who are Muslim. The Crown and some of the victims' families had asked the judge for consecutive periods of parole ineligibility. They wanted 25 years for each of the men he killed. But the judge said despite the horror of his crimes, 150 years without parole would be disproportionate and unconstitutional. He rewrote the law from the bench to hand down a 40-year sentence instead. It's been a long and tough process for the victims' families. We want to salute the courage and we wish them well in the future. Since today's decision, it's a very, very long decision by Justice Rutt, we will take the opportunity to read it and see if we will or not go to appeal in this case. Members of the Muslim community say they are shocked and sickened that Bissonnette will be eligible for parole when he is 67. Very likely these orphans will be still alive and the debate will be open again and they will relive again what we, relive, what we lived today. We were wishing to have the peace of mind and to have these widows and these orphans starting their life in dignity and peacefully and start a new page. The judge said Bissonnette's mental state, his anxiety, panic attacks and suicidal thoughts contributed to his crime, but said it wasn't the main factor. As he read Bissonnette his sentence, Uwat told him his hate and racism destroyed dozens of people's lives. People who today are angry and saddened because they feel justice was not done. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Quebec City. And convicted serial killer Bruce MacArthur will spend 25 years behind bars before he can apply for parole. MacArthur killed eight men over the course of seven years, spreading fear through Toronto's gay community. As Joanna Romuletis tells us, his victims' loved ones say the sentence is not harsh enough. In a way, today marked the beginning of the end, the start, perhaps, of some healing. For the friends, the sisters, the brothers, the mother who hasn't said a word. She doesn't have to. The grief is carved on her face. In court, Bruce MacArthur sat expressionless as Justice John McMahon read out his reasons for sentencing. His words often scathing, he called MacArthur morally bankrupt, a sexual predator and killer who lured his victims on the pretext of consensual sex and killing them for his own warped and sick gratification. The men, the judge says, died a slow and painful death, were staged in perverse and degrading fashions, then photographed, only to face even more indignity in MacArthur's hands. The ability to decapitate and dismember his victims and do it repeatedly, the judge says, is pure evil. And yet by pleading guilty to murdering the eight men, the judge pointed out MacArthur spared their families the nightmare of a graphic trial, and the killer's age was also a mitigating factor. In what came down to a symbolic decision, the judge ordered MacArthur serve his sentences concurrently, or all at once. If he's still alive, MacArthur will be 91 when he can apply for parole in 25 years, and the judge says his chances of parole are remote at best. The Crown wanted MacArthur sentenced to 50 years without parole. It didn't comment today, but in a statement called the crime one of stark horror, one that offers no closure. Few family members spoke later, as if defeated by it all. Among them, a mother whose family says, can't stop crying. Her husband died of a heart attack after they found out what happened to their son. They lost their son, they lost their husband and uh, brother. They didn't get anything. I don't think he deserves what he got. I think he deserves a lot more harsh of a sentence. This woman knew three of the victims and says the sentence doesn't amount to justice. I don't think that's enough, co enough comfort for the families or the community or the people that he's killed. I, I think that, you know, if you're going to do a maximum crime, you deserve the maximum sentence, which is life times eight. As for police... It's still a life sentence. The only difference is the parole eligibility. And as Justice McMahon said, he can't imagine 
a parole board ever letting Mr. MacArthur out, even if by some fluke he lives to the age of 91. We don't expect to see Mr. MacArthur in public again. We're satisfied with the sentence. Yes, we are. And with the ending it brings, at least for now. We were in the courts for years sometimes with a basic murder case. So to have one uh, where someone's charged with eight murders uh, conclude within 13 months of the arrest, you know, uh, you know, it, it's, it's fulfilling. It, it's nice that it is done. This investigation is far from done, so it, it's not done in that aspect, but it is, it is nice to have the court uh, process done. What do you mean it's not done? What else? We, like I've mentioned before, we will continue to look at any connection that Bruce MacArthur has to anybody, missing persons, uh, other, you know, we've looked at cold cases. CBC's Ioana Romeliotis reporting tonight from Toronto. The political pressure is mounting on the governing federal Liberal Party after accusations of political interference. We'll take you to Ottawa next. And here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. If I had left 10 minutes later, the road would have been clear and that would have been as much slush. But unfortunately, I thought I'd beat the, the weather home and it beat me. Well, parts of Vancouver Island got a big dump of snow today. And while Metro Vancouver has been spared, special weather statements are in place. Wind gusts of up to 90 kilometers an hour are expected to slam the south coast 
persisting into tomorrow. 25 cattle are dead after fire tore through a dairy farm in Pitt Meadows early this morning. Three buildings went up in flames along Old Dudney Trunk Road. Neighbors woke up to the smell of smoke and ran out to help try to save the animals. Devastating to, for example, uh, the smaller female crabs which get in there. And those are the ones that are responsible for repopulating right once they're fertilized. More than 200 traps with 1,200 crabs have been released back into Boundary Bay. Officers from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans seized the traps after a two-day crackdown on poaching. Conservatives and New Democrats are both demanding a parliamentary investigation today. In its response to a Globe and Mail report that the Prime Minister's office pressured the former Attorney General to intervene in a criminal case involving SNC-Lavalin. As David Cochran tells us, the opposition may be vocal, but the person at the centre of the controversy is almost silent. Conservative leader Andrew Scheer is calling for an emergency meeting of the Justice Committee. This matter strikes at the very heart of our rule of law where Conservatives can grill top officials from the Prime Minister's office. Uh, if the Liberals vote this down, it is quite clear that there is a cover-up going on. All this cries out for an investigation. The NDP is on board and also wants an ethics probe. We're asking the Prime Minister, if there's been no wrongdoing in this situation, to invite the Ethics Commissioner to have an independent investigation. The opposition is singing the same tune, and so is the government. The allegations in the Globe story this morning are false. Uh, neither the, the current, current Minister of Justice or the former Minister of Justice has been pressured or directed by the Prime Minister or anyone in the Prime Minister's office to take a decision, decision in this matter. Mr. Speaker, as the Prime Minister stated earlier today, the allegations contained in the Globe and Mail article, article are, are false. Prime Minister, what's your reaction? To but the it's not all today, harmony. Please. I don't have any comment. And were you pressured by PMO, ma'am? Anyone in PMO? Jody Wilson-Raybould has refused to back the Prime Minister's assertion that nobody pressured her. Today, she issued this statement. As the former Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada, I am bound by solicitor-client privilege in this matter, which doesn't explain this. I, I want to tell Canadians that, uh, and the Prime Minister has been very clear on this, that nothing inappropriate has happened. David uh, Lametti, the new uh, Justice uh, Minister and Attorney General, has been speaking publicly Mr. since Speaker, this story broke, apparently Minister not bound Day. by anything, telling CBC Radio's The House nothing improper happened. She can put an end to this by saying, I wasn't pressured. So why again, isn't she? Again, I can't, can't speak for her. Uh, the Prime Minister has been clear. I've spoken to my experience. I think Canadians can be reassured that, that, uh, that there has been nothing inappropriate here. But Wilson-Raybould's silence persists. The now Veterans Affairs Minister could make this go away with a single statement denying the Globe and Mail story, a statement she clearly has no intention of making. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. And at 6.37 on this Friday evening, here's a live look at downtown Vancouver tonight. The Lights on the North Shore Mountains over there. Well, the snow slid past Metro Vancouver today, but now it's the wind that's causing concern. Amy is here with a forecast next.
This weather update is brought to you by Remax. What's your home worth? Find out with our instant valuation tool at Remax.ca. Amy's here. Snow kind of just slid here. past Metro mm -hmm. Vancouver, but a little uh, you know, bad on the island. Oh, the island. Very yeah. yes. Yeah. So we we can't complain that we no. have gorgeous weather. And now it's the wind. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna have to keep an eye on it's that. Always something. <laughs> there is always something. It's an interesting time of year. Yeah. Uh, but yes, we are definitely not dealing with much snow, but we are going to see those winds picking up. Uh, we'll take a look at the time lapse, and we did see a few little flurries here and there this morning. But all in all, uh, we sort of dodged that. It just stuck to Vancouver Island, but it's definitely going to be a bit of a colder stretch that we're heading into. We're going to. We, we saw some clouds, of course, today, and that kept a lot of the heat in if you can call it that, but uh, we are gonna see things clearing up over the next couple of days, so that, of course, means we're gonna see those temperatures dropping way down, and with those winds coming in, that Arctic outflow, seeing this very cold air funneling down uh, with the wind chill, it will feel much colder. Already well on its way to being cold, though, we're at one degree at the airport, zero for West Vancouver, and zero in the Fraser Valley. Now, we do still have some warnings. The uh, Arctic outflow warnings are up for many areas, right from the interior to the north coast and down towards us. We do have wind warnings for Metro Vancouver and out to the Fraser Valley, and those gusts could get up to 90 kilometers an hour. Uh, the wind warnings are up for areas along uh, the Gulf Islands, the Sunshine Coast, and some parts of Vancouver Island on the southwest uh, corner. So do keep that in mind. What we're going to see over the next couple of days, though, is things generally clearing out. You can see all that snow activity. They've got heavy snowfall down in Washington, uh, and we will see a light dusting up in the interior. We are going to keep an eye on this next system making its way towards us midweek next week, and that's when we have another chance of seeing uh, some snowfall for areas around Metro Vancouver and Vancouver Island, but what we're really focusing on is that cold over the next several days. It is not going to be warming up anytime soon, but once the winds ease, by tomorrow morning we're going to be left with quite lovely weather though cold uh, so all of this clouds that you see will be earlier in the morning and then as those winds really push things aside we'll start to see things clearing but cold up to minus nine in Whistler minus seven in Hope and minus three in Abbotsford these are the highs of course keep in mind uh, we will see just a bit of snow for some areas around the Kootenays uh, Kamloops and uh, or sorry Cranbrook and then Kelowna you could see a little bit of snow and very cold minus seven minus 11 for Kamloops uh, minus 15 for Dees Lake Prince Rupert you're going to be dealing with those very cold winds overnight and early tomorrow and then things will settle down minus one in Victoria so we just have to kind of get through the next 24 hours and then we will see things uh, clearing up. So taking a look at the five-day forecast, we are of course heading into a very sunny stretch. So that uh, cloud that we see in the morning, there's a very chance of a slight chance of a few random snowflakes overnight and early tomorrow morning, but it won't really accumulate to anything. And then we'll see that wind chill tonight and tomorrow down around minus 13 or 14. Oh. For those areas with the warnings for the Arctic outflow, uh, the wind chill down around minus 20. And of course wow. that risk of frostbite is uh, quite high, so just be careful out there tonight and tomorrow. No kidding. Yeah. Wow. It's winter. Anyway. All right. Thanks, Amy. You're welcome. Uh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, it's me. A unique discovery has been made in a cave near Port Alberni. A tiny creature, previously unknown to science, was founded by a BC man. And now his name is part of science history. Czech News' Dean Stoltz explains it all started with a picture. Craig Wagnell is getting his gear ready for another caving trip this weekend. He's going back to an area southwest of Port Alberni where he discovered a new cave in 2000. Then four years after that, he discovered something else inside it. So I was just up there taking pictures of the Ammonites and uh, this little guy photobombed a picture. He posted pictures online and was soon getting requests for more information and to send a sample to a professor in the States. He learned it was a deplorin or a species of small, primitive, wingless insects. Completely white, and um, right there, it, it has no, no eyes. It's not needing eyes because it lives in complete darkness. And this doesn't happen overnight. This happens over thousands and if not millions of years. Unfortunately, that professor fell ill and the research stalled until a friend of Craig took this video a few years later in the same spot. Then a researcher in Spain saw the video on YouTube and it took until last year to get confirmation that this little white cave dwelling insect is something no one had ever seen before. There's only, uh, I think, two other species within the family. Mm -hmm. And it's the most northerly one. 
and the interest of that is um, possibilities that it uh, could have lasted through the last ice age. And that's what they're trying to find out right now. And the species now carries his name, a Hampocampo wagnelli, and he's found them in another Port Alberni area cave as well. And then I'm looking around, and there's another one. So I picked him up, and there's another one. I picked him up. I was able to get seven that day. So 15 years after first spotting it on the floor of a cave, he just found out yesterday that it is indeed a brand new discovery. Ecstatic. Yeah, really, really, really happy. But I knew it was, you know, coming. It was a long time coming. I have patience. A what? Hampo Campo Wagnelli. That is fascinating. That's the name. Yes. That's the name, yeah. Okay. No eyes. Lives in complete darkness. No wings. No wings, yeah. See what you learn on this program? <laughs> Very informative, Joe. That yes. was uh, Dean Stoltz from Shack with that uh, story, by the way. The world's richest man says the National Enquirer is trying to extort him. So Jeff Bezos is going on the offensive. That's next. Well, the richest man in the world is accusing the publishers of the National Enquirer of blackmail and extortion. Jeff Bezos said the company, which has ties to President Donald Trump, threatened to publish embarrassing, intimate photos. But as Lindsay Duncombe explains, instead of making a deal, Bezos went public. This all started last month. The head of Amazon, Jeff Bezos, had just announced he was getting a divorce. The National Enquirer published a cover story with pictures and private messages between Bezos and his new girlfriend. In a blog post, Bezos says he asked his head of security to investigate how the tabloid got the pictures and why it was going after him. He said AMI, which owns the Inquirer, threatened to publish more embarrassing photos if Bezos didn't stop the investigation. He said the company demanded Bezos make a public statement. 
affirming that they have no knowledge or basis for suggesting AM's coverage was politically motivated or influenced by political forces. Bezos posted the email exchange, including the graphic description of the intimate photos, online. Writing any personal embarrassment AMI could cause me takes a back seat because there is a much more important matter involved here. If in my position I can't stand up to this kind of extortion, how many people can? There is important context here. Bezos owns the Washington Post. Donald Trump has attacked Bezos for the paper's coverage of his presidency. The president has had a cozy relationship with the National Enquirer for years. The paper recently admitted it coordinated with the Trump campaign to pay hush money to a Playboy model so she wouldn't go public about her affair with Trump. It signed an immunity deal to avoid prosecution. The paper's publisher, David Pecker, has long been accused of catch-and-kill operations, paying someone for a story, then keeping it quiet to protect the powerful. In his memo, Bezos said that Pecker was particularly sensitive about the paper's ties to Saudi Arabia. Extortion is a crime, and there are reports that federal prosecutors are looking into these allegations. In a statement, AMI said it believes it acted lawfully in its coverage of Bezos. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Washington. Are your name and cell phone number all it takes for a hacker to take over your telecom account? Marketplace's latest investigation has found a few pieces of your personal information could leave you and your accounts vulnerable. Charles Agro reports. Hello, I'm I'm good. My name is Charles Actually, his name is Joshua Kremba. He is an ethical hacker impersonating me to illustrate how the latest type of phone hack works. Uh, date of birth is February. A few personal details later and this customer service rep is buying it. Krumba is in my cable account and I'm locked out. The technique he used is called social engineering. A hacker charms a customer service agent using a few publicly available pieces of my personal information, eventually convincing them to hand over the rest. It's just psychology. So if you understand how somebody's going to react to something, you can easily uh, manipulate somebody into giving you information. While I got locked out of my accounts, others have suffered far worse at the hands of hackers. $30,000 equivalent in crypto. Former cryptocurrency executive Aaron Tomlinson lost thousands after hackers used a series of eight online chats to convince customer service reps to hand over enough information to take over her account. As far as she can tell, the hackers only had her name and telephone number when they started. They were given my account number, my email, my credit card information, my birth date. Since Canada's privacy commissioner started requiring companies to report privacy breaches in November, there have been more than a dozen reported cases involving social engineering in this country's telecommunications sector alone. What could companies be doing to better protect consumers? I, I think the biggest thing is education. We have got to do more in making our people aware that these things happen. Well, I mean, it's, it's obviously alarming. Um, every, every Canadian, for sure, is at risk right now. Tomlinson wasn't happy with the solutions Rogers offered her, so she's taking them to court. Rogers declined to speak to us about her case, as it's before the courts, but they do say they're not responsible for what happened to her. In an email, Rogers did tell us they provide ongoing training for their staff and that they take their customers' privacy and security very seriously. Charles Siagro, CBC News, Toronto. You can watch the full Marketplace investigation tonight on CBC TV at 8 o'clock or stream anytime with CBC Gem. And in just a few minutes, we'll bring you this week's Friday film review. It's a new take on an old classic with... A slight twist, Eli Glasner's review of What Men Want is coming up next.
It is Friday, that means another film review, and tonight it's another remake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hollywood is all about remakes these mm -hmm. days. The latest, the reworking of a rom-con hit from 20 years ago. <laughs> it. it. <laughs> yeah. CBC's Eli Glasner takes a peek at this generation's version of What Men Want. We begin with Ali, as played by Taraji P. Henson. She's a rising star in a sports agency, but that star is bumping against the glass ceiling. The firm is a boys club and, well, she just doesn't play well with others. Part of the problem is her overly aggressive attitude. Ali is all about Ali, and for her, men are just a problem to solve until one night. Her friends invite her to a psychic with a special drink. You want to know how to connect with men, right? Well, I can help you open your inner portal. So let's just have some tea. Oh, I don't really like tea. No, 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 have some. That's actually musician Erica Badu, who is funny, freaky, and flaky. Perfect casting. So Ali takes a sip and eventually wakes up with this new ability. She can hear men's thoughts. Soon she's driving to work and freaking out her assistant, a scene-stealing performance by Josh Brenner. Holy crap, can you hear my inner thoughts? I can hear your inner thoughts! Now, let me level with you. When I first saw the trailer for this, I was worried it was one of those films where they cram all the jokes into the trailer and all that's left are 90 minutes of awkward agony. But I was wrong. First of all, I had no idea Taraji could be this funny. Yeah, I mean, the physical comedy alone, there's no holding back. In particular, a few hilarious bedroom scenes where she is fully in control. And speaking of romance, part of what makes what men want work so well is the relationship in the middle. What starts as a scheme to use a bartender to further her career gets deeper. And Why would I waste a second on her when I got you standing right here in front of me? You know, let's be honest. If you go back to the first What Women Want, it's kind of, can I say skeevy? Watching Mel Gibson use his powers to manipulate women. But the update tackles the challenges that Ali faces as a black woman in the workplace in a refreshingly frank way. So, what's the downside? Well, it's a rom-com, which means there are secrets, and when they're revealed, the predictable crisis does hurt the momentum. Still, there are killer scenes, a great soundtrack, especially if you're a fan of En Vogue, making this the girls' trip comedy of 2019. Three and a half stars out of five. Eli Glaster, CBC News, Toronto. Three and a half. Wow, right. Half, yeah. I guess one and a half, but uh, okay. Oh, I was feeling generous with two and a half. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, when it snows here or when it's threatening to snow, mm -hmm. and, you know, we all, we don't all freak out. People kind of get worried and yeah, concerned and alarmed. And yeah, and then the rest but of the country. Still don't prepare. Still don't prepare, still don't that's prepare. right. Yeah. Panic and the rest of the country yeah. mocks us. Right? Yes, yes. But our prairie neighbors have been kind enough to. Uh, Give us a few tips on surviving any snowfall. Wait for it to melt tomorrow? <laughs> the rain will wash it away, right? They're fine. They'll be, they'll be okay. They'll have a good time. They'll shut everything down. They're lucky. They, uh, they don't know how to deal with it, so they'll get the day off work and school. They have trouble driving anyway because I think they got more legal pot out there than we've got here in Alberta. It'll be okay. Don't go down any hills and uh, eat lots of chips. It's a good excuse to stay home. I'm from the West Coast, so being from Victoria, I'm quite used to it. Uh, we get snow out there, it happens. Here, much colder, but you know what? You still gotta be tough to live on the West Coast. So we had asked our CBC stations across Canada right. to give us some yeah, advice, tips. and that's what they... They were eager to oblige. Yes, they, they were. were. <laughs> they a bit were of a mocking clear. tone. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Except Maybe Charlottetown. Like Apparently that. nobody in Charlottetown wanted to tackle the issue. So. Fair enough. Dan Bird is here at 11 o'clock with your next local news. Have a wonderful weekend. Here we go. Nice.